I was losing weight due to stress. But I didn't know what to do or who to talk to. That's when she saved me. Encouraged by her gentle voice, I spoke about my problems. Then, waiting for me was an unbelievable comeback story. My name is Jake Weston. I don't know what my parents look like. I spent my infancy in an orphanage and by the time I could remember, I was in a children's care home. I don't know who or where my father is, and my mother apparently abandoned me and disappeared repeatedly. She never came to visit, so I don't even know what she looks like. But I'm okay with that. Although I was not wealthy living in the facility, I knew that the staff took good care of me. There were many kids at the facility, so I never felt lonely. There was one kid I got particularly close to. Her name was Madison. She was a cute girl, a year younger than me. Madison came to the care home when I was nine and she was eight. She was thin and not very lively when we first met. At first, Madison refused to eat. I want to go home to mom and dad. She kept saying that and crying all the time, so the staff seemed to be losing their grip on her. The other kids around the same age, Sally and Tim, would comfort her, saying, you'll meet your mom someday, and if you're a good girl, they'll come to pick you up. Sure enough, some kids do get picked up by their parents and leave the facility. But not everyone. I gently approached Madison when she was down. Do you want to see your mom and dad? I want to see them. Seeing her teary-eyed, I felt like I had to protect her. I told Madison that it's not lonely even without a mother. Because I had Madison and Madison had me. From then on, we supported each other like real siblings and grew older together. But we could only stay at the facility until 18 years old. After high school, I got a job at a small food manufacturing company and started living on my own. When Madison turned 18, she borrowed student loans to attend nursing school and started living in a dorm. Her parents didn't come to pick her up even when she turned 18. The company I was able to get a job at after high school didn't pay much. But I was grateful that they hired me, a high school graduate. In fact, I only had interviews at two companies when I was job hunting in high school. That was only possible thanks to the school going out of their way to vouch for me. I'm not picky. I would do anything if I could get hired because I have to live on my own. That's what I thought. So, I endured even if I was yelled at for no reason, had my chair kicked hard, and had to work overtime without pay. The president of the company I joined was a beautiful woman in her 40s named Aria, but she was only nice on the outside and was harsh to the employees. By the way, the chairman was Aria's father, and he seemed to have the same personality. In particular, he seemed to use me as a stress relief and made fun of me. You should be grateful just for being hired as a high school graduate. I can fire you anytime, you know, but then, I guess you won't be able to pay your rent, huh? It must be hard being po and parentless haha. Although it was frustrating, I couldn't say anything back. It's true that I might not find another company that would hire a high school graduate, and above all, I didn't want to worry Madison, who I often contact. I told Madison it was a good company. I didn't want to say things like, I quit, or I can't find another job. I've always been like a big brother to Madison. I didn't want my little sister to see me in such a pitiful state. But now I wonder why I didn't quit my job sooner. I did once reach my breaking point when I developed stress-induced gastroenteritis and talked to my boss about leaving the company. But immediately, CEO Oria came to see me. So, you want to quit, huh? She asked. I told her, albeit nervously, that I wanted to quit and get my health back on track. But CEO Oria just laughed off my concerns. Don't be a baby. If you quit here, 
Are you just going to run away whenever something goes wrong at your next job? I don't intend to. I was weak and the words were not coming out of my mouth properly as I was being stuffed by the beautiful CEO. I'm not letting you off the hook. The real world isn't so forgiving. No company will hire you if you quit your first job right after getting hired out of high school. I was a high school graduate, and this company was my first job. I didn't have many friends. I didn't realize that the environment I was in was toxic and abnormal. The daily verbal abuse from my boss was physically and mentally exhausting, and I was constantly sleep deprived. I wasn't getting any information about other companies, so I assumed that other companies must be like this. One might say I was naive, but looking back, it almost feels like I was brainwashed. Amidst such daily life, one day, I was summoned by CEO Oria. Inside, I was wondering what she was going to say to me, hoping she wouldn't throw something at me. In her office, CEO Oria was waiting with a smirk on her face. You're single, no girlfriend, right? Well, who'd want to be with a useless bum like you anyway, so I'll marry you. I was so taken aback, I froze for a few seconds. I, I don't quite understand. This was the story from CEO Oria. Apparently, CEO Arian is currently having an affair with another company's CEO. It's been going on for years, not just a fling. The other person is married and had kids, and I was disgusted with the CEO Aria, who knew that much and had a relationship with him. Recently, both Aria's father and her lover's parents started to suspect the affair. In order to hide it, the CEO Aria had come up with the idea of marrying me. I don't have any desire to have kids or raise a family. I just want to spend all my money on myself. I still want to be with my lover since we share common interests. Only then did I realize the ludicrous situation I had been dragged into. But why do you want to marry me? Would anyone really consider marrying someone they'd been harassing, even if it was just a sham? I've already told you, I don't care who it is. You have no money, no parents. You're perfect to keep a secret with. I felt dizzy. It's true, I have no money, no parents, no higher education. But being forced into a sham marriage, I felt like crying at my own pathetic state. And then, forgetting that I was in front of CEO Aria, I blurted out, I should have a choice too. Hearing this, CEO Aria turned beach red and threw a stack of documents from her desk at me. Well then, how about getting fired and understand? You might not find another job. You dare disrespect me. I won't let this slide. I'll give you some time, but you better say yes. If you refuse, you're fired. And I'm not talking about three months from now. It'll be effective immediately. From that day on, I felt like I was barely alive. Getting fired was a problem, but marrying CEO Aria would be hell. I knew that much. Unable to give an answer, I continued going to work. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep due to anxiety. I didn't realize that my decision-making ability was getting worse. A few days after CEO Oria proposed to me, Madison came to my house. It was an unexpected visit. We hadn't planned anything. Seeing my face at the door, Madison was taken aback. Jake, you've got dark circles under your eyes and you've lost weight. You're not eating enough, are you? You look really pale. Madison's words made me realize that I might have lost some weight. I hadn't taken a good look in the mirror or stepped on a scale, so I hadn't noticed. Standing aimlessly at my front door, Madison forcefully nudged me from behind and sat me down on the living room couch. I came over because I was worried. You didn't reply to my texts or calls. I thought you were busy with work, maybe doing overtime, but here you are at home. You could have responded, don't make me worry like this. All I could muster in response to Madison's words was a weak year. In the meantime, Madison was briskly arranging Tupperware on the table. It seemed she had prepared some food. 
I made all the dishes you love, Jake. So eat a lot. I figured you might have been too busy to cook, so I also brought some rice. I'll put this in a bowl. Madison's voice was somehow comforting, and the aroma wafting from the warm dishes was incredibly appetizing. I took Madison's suggestion and started eating the rice and dishes. Grilled pork, casserole, fried chicken, potato salad, scrambled eggs, all my favorite foods. It had been a while since I had a leisurely meal or even ate something that someone else had cooked. Delicious. I said and realized that I was crying. In a panic, I looked at Madison, fearing she had seen me crying, but the tears just wouldn't stop. On the contrary, they began to flow more and more. All the hardship and suffering I had been enduring seemed to explode the moment I looked at Madison. I continued eating while sobbing. Madison simply watched me with a kind smile. If you're hungry, that's a good sign. Eat plenty. I made all this just for you, Jake. And so, under Madison's watchful gaze, I continued to eat and cry. After the meal, Madison made me a cup of cocoa. I usually drink coffee, but perhaps seeing how exhausted I was, she decided to avoid it. I took a sip of the warm cocoa and looked at Madison. When I did, our eyes met. She had been looking at me too. From her gaze, I could tell she was worried about me. I had avoided consulting her about my boss and work to prevent her from worrying, but I realized that I was causing her plenty of worry even now. But. I decided to tell her everything. I didn't want to lie or hide anything from her, as she had been so supportive and concerned about me. Every day at work, I was subjected to harassment and yelling. I was loaded with unpaid overtime and had no time to rest. And just recently, I was told to get married as a cover for an affair. Upon hearing this, I could see Madison's brow furrow. She was clearly upset. Why don't you just quit that job? Why are you so attached to that company? Because I only have a high school diploma and I don't have family. They told me I won't find another job. I might even struggle to pay my rent. Immediately, Madison started browsing something on her phone and then showed me the screen. There were various job postings that were open to high school graduates. It's true that there are places that will hire high school graduates as full-time employees, though not as many as college graduates, and even part-time workers can earn enough to get by. It's okay to try to get a full-time job from a part-time job. What Madison was saying was pretty much common sense, but it felt as if I was hearing it for the first time. Besides, Jake, you're not one to waste money. You must have enough saved for rent for a while. Even if you quit your job, you'll be able to survive for a while. Madison told me to take my checkbook, so I did and checked my bank balance. Just as Madison had said, I had enough saved in my account to cover my rent for a considerable period, since I didn't have any extravagant spending habits. I have money. Why did I convince myself that I couldn't quit my job? As I muttered this, Madison tightly grasped my hand. You've been working too hard, Jake. That company is horrible. Under normal circumstances, anyone would realize how absurd the company and its boss are. They could even be sued. Your judgment has dulled due to the constant denial and exhaustion. Her words struck me to the core. What? What should I do? For the first time, I admitted my weakness to Madison, asking for her help. Madison smiled at me confidently. Leave it to me. I know people who can help. Why don't you go to bed, Jake? I'll call in sick for you tomorrow, so you can sleep as much as you want. I wondered if it was okay to skip work like that. As I was thinking this, the shrill voice of my boss, Oria, echoed in my ears. Useless. I could hear her yelling at me. Scary images of Oria played in my mind one after another, and I became scared. Seeing me freeze up, Madison, who seemed to have sensed something, gently took my hand. And that's when she said, 
It's going to be all right. When Madison held my hand and made me lie down in bed, the fear and anxiety within me gradually subsided and my eyelids slowly closed. The next day, I woke up well past 3 p.m. I was surprised to find that I had slept for more than half a day without waking up even once. Even after I woke up, Madison continued to take care of me in every possible way, and that evening she took me to a cafe. There, I was introduced to a middle-aged man. He was no acquaintance of mine, and he was too old to be Madison's friend. Seeing my puzzled face, Madison said something I did not expect. This man is my father. The middle-aged man in front of me nodded with a smile. From what I heard, he was indeed her biological father. Madison's mother passed away shortly after giving birth to her. Her father, Howard, who had since become mentally and physically unwell and found it difficult to work or raise a child, had to put Madison in a foster home. After that, Howard had been admitted to a mental hospital and rallied on his parents' home and was able to return to society. Although he hadn't seen Madison for many years out of guilt, he had apparently come to see her two years ago. At first, Madison couldn't accept her father, but recently it seemed they were finally able to build a good relationship. At first, I was so angry at him for abandoning me, but then working as a nurse and seeing people who are grieving after losing a partner or suffering from mental illness, I started to think that my father must have been struggling too. I still don't feel like we are a parent and a child, but I think it would be nice if we could understand each other better and gradually build a good relationship. She seemed to have intended to introduce him to me once my work situation calmed down. Howard, it turns out, is currently working as a journalist. I've heard about you from Madison. You've been looking out for her like a big brother since she was a little girl, haven't you? I am grateful for that just like Madison. That's what I want to help you this time. Yeah. Uh, as I was taken aback, Madison threw me a lifeline. Jake, he also posts articles online. He knows some lawyers, too. If you go and say you're quitting all by yourself, you might be sweet-talked into staying. I think it's okay to rely on Howard and other people. I bowed deeply to Howard, who had gentle eyes very much like Madison's. I want to quit that company and start over my life. Could you? Could you help me? Howard confidently replied, leave it to me. Howard's actions from then on were swift. He brought in a lawyer he knew and negotiated with my company on my behalf, allowing me to easily quit my job. When they were informed that the company's treatment of me would be made into an article and published online, the CEO and chairman of the board seemed quite frightened. They must have been aware that they were doing something wrong. Thanks to the testimonies of other employees, the CEO admitted to his verbal abuse towards me. I received an official apology and severance pay plus compensation for emotional distress that was more than double what I had expected. I was so afraid of quitting the company, but when I did, I felt surprisingly lighthearted. When I expressed my gratitude to Howard again later, he taught me something I didn't expect. Actually, Madison didn't ask me to help her childhood friend. She said, I want you to help the person I love. Like me, Howard was driven to the edge both mentally and physically when he lost his wife. That's why he wanted to be of help to me, it seemed. Hearing this, I devoted myself to job hunting to respond to Madison's wishes. I confessed to Madison and started dating her as soon as I found a new part-time job. I love you, Madison, and I want to be with you as a partner from now on. I've been wondering when you were going to tell me. I've always loved you, too, ever since we were children, and you were always there for me like a big brother. So we started dating, and now, one year later, I'm working and studying to become a child care worker via distance learning. I hope to work in a foster home like the one where we grew up someday. We started living together last month. 
I plan to propose to Madison again when my dream of becoming a child care worker comes true. I'm still studying to become a child care worker, and Madison still has student loans left from her nursing school days. Life is not easy, and it is often difficult to balance part-time work and studying. But I feel very encouraged to be able to support each other with Madison, and I feel happy to be living with the person I love. From now on, I want to live my life cherishing the people who care for me. Heck, what? Morning already. I felt thirsty and opened my eyes to see the dazzling morning sun streaming in through the window. I'm John Doe, 28 years old. Just a regular single guy working at an advertising company. Yesterday, we had a company party. Perhaps I drank too much, I can't remember anything. I managed to wake up my lazy body, which still had some alcohol left in it, and looked around to find my tie and bag carelessly tossed on the floor. Perhaps I had let loose a little too much, being our first party in a while. With a pounding headache from the hangover, I stood there in a daze when suddenly my cell phone rang. The call was from my colleague, Bob. Hey John, good morning, you okay after last night? Bob's voice on the other end of the phone sounded like he found something amusing. Maybe I messed up after all. Honestly, I'm a bit dizzy with this hangover. I can't remember anything from last night. Did I do something weird? No way, you don't remember doing all that. As the truth unfolded from Bob's words, my face turned redder by the minute. At last night's party, I met our junior colleague, Emma, after a long time. She was a sweet 24-year-old woman, a junior in the department I used to be a part of. However, for some reason, I had been keeping my distance from her. Apparently, Emma didn't find it amusing and took this opportunity to approach me. Don't you think you've been a little cold lately, John? You used to be there for me. That's right. Being a senior in the same department, I often listened to Emma's worries. But she consulted me so often without considering my convenience, it was frankly bothersome. I'm sorry, but I just switched departments and frankly, I have enough on my plate right now. Plus, you have a boyfriend. He might worry if you're frequently dining alone with another man, don't you think? Yes. Emma had a boyfriend. Yet, she kept insisting on talking and inviting me to bars and restaurants. I listened to her complaints, and because of our positions, I ended up paying every time. Looking back, I might have been taken advantage of. In the past, however, I was swallowed up by her strong pace and was at her beck and call. Tonight, however, I managed to express my intentions with the help of alcohol. I drank too much due to the tension and my memory cut off from there. According to Bob, she seemed clearly discontent with my words. So, you won't listen to me anymore, John. That's right. I think it's for the best. Even to an outsider, Emma seemed too persistent. I was getting tired of it. Then she provocatively said, you refuse smart talks, but you're often out with department head Catherine, aren't you? Isn't that unfair? She's indeed beautiful, but somewhat aloof, and she's nine years older than me. Oh, you're not by any chance attracted to Catherine, are you? Don't badmouth Catherine. According to Bob, I abruptly cut her off by slamming my beer glass on the table. Emma, who only knew my usual calm demeanor, was taken aback by my sudden change but the surprise didn't end there. Incredibly, I made a shocking statement at the party. Yes, that's right. I love my department manager. You just don't know it, Emma. The manager in reality is really cute. Who cares if she's older? Who cares about her position? I love her. I can't stand it. I'm crazy about her. Just saying it was enough to make me blush, but what was really bad was that at that moment, the manager was standing right behind me. She was late to the drinking party because she had errands that day, and she came at the absolute worst possible timing. 
After that, I drank too much and blacked out, fell on the spot, and Bob somehow got me home by taxi. Listening to the whole story made me despair at my own reckless behavior, but Bob seemed to enjoy it till the end. To be honest, the way you interfered, Emma, ruined the fun atmosphere of the drinking party. Listening to what you, John, said felt so refreshing. Maybe the manager was happy to receive a once in a lifetime love confession like that. No, there's no way, right? If it's just me embarrassing myself, it would have been fine. But to even get the section chief in trouble is another story. This situation developed, but the trigger goes back six months ago. When I was transferred to the advertising department, the manager of the advertising department, Catherine, became my immediate boss. She is 33, five years older than me, and single. She has beautiful dark brown glossy hair tied back and beautiful features with cat-like eyes shining in a deep brown color. She stood out even in the office. Not only her work, but also the way she dressed in a suit on her slender figure was dazzling, and she had many fans in the company, regardless of gender. I was glad to be able to work under such an excellent person, but it seemed that she did not have a good impression of me, and actually said this to me. John, please stop messing up the relationships within the department. Currently, it seems like you are having a relationship with a female employee who has a boyfriend. Apparently, she thinks that I'm having a relationship with Emma. But as I mentioned before, I was just listening to her story. I tried to explain the details, but she said, that's enough, and cut off my explanation, so the misunderstanding was never cleared up. Actually, I've been approached by many women besides Emma for advice on their problems. I'm not popular with women, I'm just valued as a conversation partner. I myself thought that I might be in this role for the rest of my life, and I was about to give up on romance. The last time I dated a woman was seven years ago, when I was a junior in college. That was when I was a junior in college. My ex-girlfriend Nancy suddenly said, I've found someone I like, so I want to break up. I was shocked, but Nancy proposed. I don't want to be lovers anymore, but I hope we can be good friends. I feel very calm when I talk to you, John. As for me, I couldn't hate Nancy. So I said, let's do that with a smile. Looking back now, I was just pretending to be tough, and I might have wanted to show her my good side. I should have just cut off ties with her when we broke up, but because of my false pride, I ended up being manipulated by my ex-girlfriend. Just like now and in the past, I'm always weak to pressure, and for women I'm always just a good guy, and I never become their first choice. That was the pattern. Well, my looks are not what you would call handsome, so it can be helped. One day, a month after I was assigned to the advertising department, I and the manager were left in the office working overtime in an awkward atmosphere as usual. We had received a request for an art exhibition advertisement from a client, and the two of us were creating flyers for the art exhibition. In addition to the exhibition of famous art prints, there would also be posters and related goods for sale. The two of us were each staring at a computer, trying to create an attractive flyer that would entice customers to buy. But there was no one else in the office, and it was awkward to just work silently. Thinking that, I glanced at the manager, and she was staring at a postcard printed with a painting called Water Lilies by Monet which was one of the sales items for the art exhibition. Thinking it might start a conversation, I said, it's a beautiful painting, and she brightened her eyes and began to talk happily in a way that was completely different from usual. Isn't it, Monet is an impressionist painter, and he has painted many pictures of water lilies. This painting on the postcard is owned by the Boston Museum of Art. She talked about Monet passionately for a while. It was the first time I saw her, who was usually cool, talking so much, and I was surprised at her rich knowledge about art. However, after a while, she made a face as if she realized something and said, I'm sorry, 
I talked too much and blushed and looked down. Why are you apologizing? I didn't know what kind of painter Monet was, so I found your explanation really interesting. I also secretly thought it was cute how our section chief got so passionate talking about what she loved. But she said, enough with the pleasantries, and shook her head side to side while blushing. I know. When it comes to talking about art, I just can't help but get excited. That's perfectly fine. If we're working in advertising, knowledge of art is absolutely essential. Our conversation continued to flow naturally, and we were able to make significant progress on our flyer. As the overtime for the day was wrapping up, I decided to be bold and ask the manager, would you like to go for a drink? I thought that since we had warmed up to each other, having a drink would deepen our relationship even further. Initially, the manager squinted at me with a skeptical look. Well, aren't you involved with your junior colleague, Emma? You don't plan on making a move on an older woman like me, do you? No, not at all. Emma is infatuated with her boyfriend, and I'm just someone she talks to. Really? Well, that's okay. I'm not that kind of woman. We'll have our drink and then head straight home. Despite the manager's initial wariness, we managed to have a drink together at a local bar. The manager seemed to enjoy her draft beer and loosened up enough to talk about art as she had before. She had studied art history in college, and I found her stories fascinating. She seemed to finally let her guard down since I made no further advances. As we left the bar, she said, I had a great time. I, too, enjoyed spending time with the manager. From that day forward, the walls between us came down. We were able to work more smoothly while maintaining open communication. Whenever our schedules matched up, we would go for drinks. It became our regular activity. One day, the manager opened up to me. I misunderstood you, John. I've heard from other employees that you often get consulted by female staff about their problems. I had an unfair prejudice against you and I've been cold towards you and I truly regret that. I smiled and said to the deeply apologetic manager, no worries at all. When someone hears that you're alone with female employees, it's a common assumption. But now I can understand why Emma feels the way she does. Just talking with you, John, is healing in its own way. The manager shared her past trauma with me. You know how I get really excited and talk nonstop when it comes to art. My previous partner found that repulsive. He didn't expect me to be so talkative because I appear to be a reserved person. It was a shock when he broke up with me because of that, so I've been trying to keep quiet ever since. Looking back, I've been treating you the same way I was treated. It was wrong of me to form a negative image of you before getting to know you. I never imagined that the manager had such a past. She had been pretending to be someone she wasn't after being rejected for being her true self. I would never do that. That's because I genuinely like the manager just the way she is. Spending time together, she became someone special to me before I knew it. Catherine, I think you're incredibly charming just the way you are. We've managed to understand each other like this, so let's let bygones be bygones. Please, I'd love for you to continue sharing about art with me. At my words, Catherine showed a genuinely happy smile. Because you are such a good listener, John, you also satisfy my frustrations. I've been holding back for so long, so I'm really grateful. But recently, I've been a little worried about you. You've been frequently asked out by Emma, and you're paying for her meals, aren't you? I think it's a bit different if you listen to her concerns once in a while. You're right. I've been feeling stressed about my relationship with Emma lately, so I think I'm going to distance myself a bit. Until now, I could only find my sense of self-worth by being close to someone. But since meeting Catherine and falling in love, I've come to want to spend my precious time with my special person. That's how I came to the events of last night. Having fallen in love with Catherine, I tried to keep a distance from Emma, 
but I never thought I would make such a blunder while drunk. I was beating myself up over it, but I decided to apologize to Catherine first and nervously made a call. Catherine must have been appalled because I went on a drinking spree. Listening to the dial tone with a bad feeling in my chest, Catherine answered the phone quicker than I expected. Hello. Catherine, I'm really sorry about yesterday. My thoughtless actions have caused you trouble. I know an apology won't cut it, but please let me get down on my knees. Whoa, John, calm down. There's no need for you to do that. Just calm down first. As soon as I heard Catherine's voice over the receiver, I blurted out an apology. From the tone of her voice, it didn't seem like she was angry. Instead, Catherine said something unexpected. I'm actually on my way to your apartment right now. You seemed really drunk yesterday, and I thought your Hanover must be rough. I'm coming to check on you. I brought some stuff, so let me in. I hadn't expected Catherine to come to my place. Ten minutes later, the intercom rang, and Catherine had bought not only food, but also mineral water and painkillers. I'm sorry for making you worry. No, it's fine. You have always been so good to me. You drank a little too much last night, didn't you? You don't look so good. You should get some rest today. Catherine said that and comforted me with kind words. But the words you drank too much stuck in my chest. Probably, she interpreted my words last night as he couldn't help it because he was drunk and was silently signaling I don't mind. But I wanted to convey my feelings properly. Catherine, even though I don't remember anything from yesterday, everything I said at the party is true. Huh. When she heard my words, Catherine looked at me with a surprised face, and I quickly started speaking to change the atmosphere while blushing. But, of course, I understand if it's impossible. I'm happy just being by your side, Catherine. If we can continue to work together from now on, that's more than enough. So please, forget what I just said. While I was talking, Catherine hugged me tightly. For a moment, I couldn't understand what was happening, but Catherine was crying, saying I'm happy, with a smile. I was really happy about what you said yesterday, but I thought I shouldn't take it seriously, so I was acting defensive. I never thought you felt the same way about me, John. Huh. You, like me too. Yes, spending time with you, I've grown to like you not as a subordinate, but as a man, but you are so kind, John. I've always told myself not to expect anything from that kindness. I've been so mean, advising you to keep your distance from Emma because I wanted you all to myself. I'm just awful, aren't I? Tears streamed down her face as I held her. Like I've said before, I love you just as you are, Catherine. I'm incredibly happy that you feel that way about me. We savored our happiness holding each other tightly. A year after we confessed our feelings to each other, I invited Kaffer into a French restaurant for our first anniversary and proposed to her there. Marry me, I said, handing her a diamond ring. Catherine beamed with joy. What a romantic proposal, my heart's racing. Because when I confessed my feelings, I was so hammered that I couldn't remember it. I wanted to etch the words of my proposal in my brain. I can see that. I will never forget today, even after decades of being married to you. I know that as long as I'm with her, we'll make many wonderful memories together. To repair the relationship with my beloved wife, we both ended up taking a rather long detour but we won't be separating anymore. This time, I want you to listen to my roundabout love story. I'm Bob Conley. At the age of 26, I met Lisa Yoder at my co-worker's wedding. Lisa was the same age as me, attending the wedding as a friend of the bride. When I saw her from the groom's men's seats giving a toast on behalf of the bride's friends, I was, to say the least, completely smitten. Her navy dress and stylish updo were just too beautiful. Love at first sight, I ended up telling my co-workers about it, and thanks to the newlyweds introducing us, I was able to get to know Lisa. Then, at the age of 26, Lisa and I got married. 
Lisa came from a father-daughter family, but she had cut ties with her father. Turns out my father-in-law had a hard time holding down a job and was fond of gambling. Lisa, who lost her mother at a young age, lived with her father but seemed to have faced many hardships. By the time Lisa became a high school student, her father had stopped coming home frequently and she moved out as soon as she graduated from high school. Since then, she seemed to have survived on her own while working part-time jobs. Knowing her past, I wanted to marry this strong woman and make her happy. So, at the age of 26, Lisa and I got married. But our life after that was not all happiness. Lisa got pregnant shortly after our marriage. We both wanted children, so of course, we were overjoyed. But she miscarried before she could enter the stable period. We could have bounced back after one miscarriage, but two consecutive ones really wore Lisa down. At the recommendation of our obstetrician, we had some tests and found out Lisa had infertility. It seems she could get pregnant but would repeatedly miscarry or have stillbirths. The cause was unknown. I'm sorry. The baby keeps coming to us but I can't seem to nurture it. Lisa sank into sadness and started having more and more depressed days. It's not your fault, Lisa. You're always trying your best. I continued to support Lisa. A while after being diagnosed with infertility, I invited Lisa on a trip to Arizona. Arizona is the hometown of Lisa's deceased mother. Although it's not really her hometown, since her maternal grandparents are also gone. But Lisa had always wanted to visit Arizona, where her kind mother grew up. I think going to Arizona was the right decision. The nature, warm weather, and delicious food of Arizona healed Lisa's body and mind and for the first time since her miscarriages, she showed a genuine smile on this trip. On the last day of the trip, we were able to see a huge rainbow in the sky. It's beautiful. I wonder if my mom and babies can see it, Lisa said while shedding tears. I also teared up while holding Lisa's shoulder. They're watching, Lisa, I'm sure your mother is watching over our children from up above. This wasn't just to comfort her, I genuinely believed it. While watching the rainbow, we talked and decided that it's okay even if we can't have children. We would support each other as a couple. Is that okay with you, Bob? If you were with someone else, you might be able to have a child without any problems. I stared right into Lisa's eyes. I didn't want her to misunderstand. I didn't marry you because you could give me children. I married you because I wanted to be with you forever. What matters most to me is that you are with me whether we have kids or not. Lisa was crying, her face covered by both hands. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm sure that while she was struggling with the diagnosis of infertility, the thought of divorce must have crossed her mind. I'm truly glad we came on this trip before things escalated, giving us the opportunity to share our feelings. I genuinely felt that way. From then on, our life as a married couple was peaceful and happy even though it was only for a brief period. When Lisa and I were 29, out of the blue, Lisa declared she wanted a divorce. Please, let's get a divorce. Lisa wasn't crying, her eyes not of hesitation, but of determination already set. Can't we talk it out anymore? I think my voice was trembling, pitifully. Dare, yeah, it's not a proposition. It's a decision I've made. I'm sorry if it seems selfish. I think it was the first time I heard Lisa's voice this cold. Why? Can you tell me why? To my question, Lisa answered without hesitation. There's someone else I love. For his sake, I can't stay with you anymore. It was the first time she referred to me as you. Her words carried such a strong will that I immediately understood that nothing I could say would change her mind. Maybe I just wasn't enough to make Lisa happy. Or perhaps being with me reminded her of our miscarriage, or maybe, I thought of various reasons. But all of them were just me trying to run away from reality. Lisa loves someone else now. That's all there is to it, and I had to accept it. I understand. As I said that, Lisa bowed her head. She kept her head down for a long time, saying, I'm sorry, thank you for everything, really, thank you. I didn't respond to her. I didn't want to hear thank you if we were getting a divorce, if she was leaving for another man, if she said that at the end, I couldn't bear any resentment. 
Even after all this, I couldn't think of Lisa as a terrible woman. Lisa in my heart was always my kind, adorable, beloved wife. Lisa signed the divorce papers and left the house the next day. I was curious whether she really went to that man, whether she could find another home that quickly, but there was no way to find out. I contacted the bride and groom of the wedding that led to our meeting and asked if they had heard anything from Lisa, but they knew nothing. No one else knew where Lisa went. Lisa had quit her part-time job, and she didn't answer her phone. The day after the divorce, I lost track of where Lisa was. I decided to believe that Lisa is probably happy with the man she loves. But I couldn't help but feel down, so I immersed myself in my work. My coworkers worried that I was overworking, but only during work could I forget about Lisa. I even went on a blind date at the request of my boss. You haven't been yourself since the divorce, have you? If you meet someone new, you might feel better, you know. The blind date I tried didn't go well. Well, the woman wanted to meet again, but I just couldn't imagine a future with her. I wanted the woman by my side to be Lisa, I just kept thinking that. I knew it was pathetic, but there was nothing I could do about these feelings. About five years after the divorce, I had a business trip to Arizona. Lisa's mother's hometown, the first place Lisa and I traveled to after our miscarriage. I decided to take some time off after the business trip and treat it like a heartbreak journey. Since five years had already passed, I had decided to take one last wander down memory lane and forget about Lisa once and for all once I left Arizona. Having finished my work at the business trip there, I went on vacation. I aimlessly toured the places Lisa and I had visited together. I remember having a great time when we came as a couple, but being alone made everything seem tasteless and boring. And so, I ended up at a small local diner we visited. Wondering what we ate here, I entered the diner and heard a bright welcome. I recognized the voice all too well and found myself staring at the waitress. Lisa. Yes, the waitress was Lisa. Her hair had grown out, she had lost some weight, but it was undeniably Lisa. Lisa also seemed to recognize me, looking dumbfounded in surprise. Bob, seeing our reactions, the restaurant owner asked if we knew each other. When I explained that I was Lisa's ex-husband, the owner was very considerate and let Lisa out for a break. But it was a real coincidence to see Lisa, and I was worried that Lisa might find it troublesome, so I looked at her cautiously. Lisa also seemed puzzled, but I thought this accidental reunion might be some sort of fate, so I called out to her. Do you want to talk outside a bit? I was prepared to be turned down, but Lisa agreed to join me. We walked silently for a while, but then it suddenly started raining, so we rushed into a pavilion in the park. That's when I saw it as Lisa wiped her rain-soaked neck with a handkerchief. It was our wedding ring, dangling from the necklace Lisa was wearing. That, huh? I pointed at Lisa's necklace. That, that's our wedding ring, the one we chose together. You said you'd met someone else, so why are you wearing it as a necklace? Caught off guard, Lisa quickly covered her necklace with her hand, but it was too late. And Lisa wasn't wearing any ring on her left hand. Perhaps she hadn't remarried. And why was she still in Arizona? Maybe there was a reason for our divorce that I didn't know about. That's what I was thinking. After all, would she lose so much weight if she was happy with someone else after leaving me? Lisa didn't seem happy at all. Even though I accepted the divorce because I wanted Lisa to be happy. Lisa, isn't there something you haven't told me? I, I couldn't forget about you these past five years. But I want to forget about you. That's why I'm touring Arizona again. But I can't go back to New York like this. Why are you still cherishing the ring? was the real reason for our divorce because you found someone else. Please, I want to know. I'm begging you. When I bowed my head, Lisa said nothing for a while. But perhaps understanding that I wasn't going to back down, she finally began to talk. The truth is, I got a call from my father. She hadn't told her estranged father where she was living after we'd got married. But my father-in-law had managed to track down Lisa's location and had apparently called her. He had lost a lot of money gambling and had racked up debts, so he asked Lisa to lend him some money. 
Of course, Lisa turned him down. But gradually, the frequency of contact increased, and it seemed that calls started coming into her workplace. Furthermore, these calls weren't just from her father, but also from unknown men claiming they had lent him money. It appears her father even threatened Lisa. If she continued refusing, he'd take it up with her husband. I was in the dark. Why didn't you come to me? Nothing happened. You must have been scared. I, I've probably already caused enough trouble for you, Bob, by not being able to have kids, haven't I? On top of that, I didn't want to worry you about money because of the debt. I didn't know if this was going to be a one-time thing with my dad asking for a loan. If there's a chance that this could go on indefinitely, I thought it would be better to separate from you, Bob. After five years, when I learned of Lisa's feelings, I felt utterly helpless. Lisa must have been heartbroken at the persistent contact from her father. At the time, I was living day to day without even realizing it. Lisa made the decision to divorce, thinking of me. Feeling like I've only ever scared and troubled you, Lisa, it makes me hate myself. Are things still the same? Are you still getting calls from your father? Lisa sadly shook her head in response. It seems her father had passed away a year after our divorce. He'd always been a heavy drinker, apparently, and he'd fallen down the stairs of a bar while drunk, which was the cause of his death. At the same time, his debts disappeared, and the calls demanding money stopped. I felt a little relieved when the debt was gone, but still. When even such a terrible parent died, I felt a little down. It's strange, the ties of blood. But I thought, that's just Lisa's kindness. Usually people would not be sad to see their detritin, neglectful parents go. Lisa, even after our divorce, remained as kind as ever, I realized. But if her father had passed away, all of our problems should have disappeared. If only she had contacted me then. As if reading my thoughts, Lisa said, Actually, I asked a friend to check on you, Bob. When I did, I heard from her that you were having a matchmaking meeting with your boss's daughter. I thought I shouldn't get in your way anymore and I couldn't contact you. I asked that friend to keep my situation a secret and didn't tell her where I was living. No, you've got it wrong. That was just a favor for my boss. I went because I had to. Of course I turned it down. There was no need for me to panic since I had a matchmaking meeting during the time we were divorced. But I rushed to make excuses. I didn't want to be misunderstood as having a successful relationship with the person I met. Apparently, my feelings for Lisa haven't changed. And I had a feeling that was hard to describe when I found out Lisa didn't divorce me because she hated me. Lisa, I still love you. I always will. I want you to be with me again. Lisa shook her head while trembling. The debt issue has been resolved. But my infertility hasn't healed. I didn't want to cause you financial trouble. But more than that, I wanted you to be a dad. You're good with kids and you're kind. But if you're going to be a dad, it can't be with me by your side. I gently put my hand on Lisa's trembling shoulder as she cried. You know, if I could, I wanted to be the father of our child. But that was just it would be nice if I could kind of thought. Didn't I tell you before, what's most important is that I want you by my side, now and always, being a couple with you is what matters most. Just then, the rain stopped, and a huge rainbow appeared in the sky. It was like the rainbow we saw together when we went on a trip to Arizona after Lisa's miscarriage. Lisa seemed to remember that too. That time as well, when you took me on a trip, we saw a rainbow just like this one. I said without taking my eyes off the rainbow. Yay, that's right. We decided then and there, watching that rainbow, that we'd support each other. I wonder if this is a coincidence. Huh, what do you mean? Lisa, wiping her tears, looked puzzled at my words. I made eye contact with Lisa and told her my thoughts. Don't you feel like this rainbow is cheering us on, like it's from Lisa's mom and our children, who passed away? I think we've never been alone. I believe Lisa's mom and our children have been watching over us all this time. Let's, let's stay together. I'm sure it'll be okay, because they're all with us. As I said this, Lisa smiled and squeezed my hand tightly. When I think about my mom and our kids watching over us, I can't lie about how I feel. I feel the same way. I've been thinking about you, Bob, all this time. 
I hugged Lisa tightly at that moment. I've wanted to do this with you for the past five years. I was a little worried when I hugged her again after such a long time because she had lost weight. I've been waiting for this for five years. Just as Lisa wished, I held her tight. After a while, Lisa began living with me again. We also got remarried. When we got remarried, we went to formally greet my parents again. And that's when Lisa spoke up right there. I will never let him feel sorrow again. I will make him happy, she declared. I was moved to tears when I fought back on the past five years. Lisa gently wiped away my tears with a handkerchief. I'm sorry for all the tears. It's okay. I'll be right next to you to wipe them away from now on. Despite being a man, I cried hard at her words. Two years after our remarriage, we were blessed with a child. We didn't know if the infertility treatment would work, but we discussed it as a couple and decided to give it a shot. Holding our newborn baby, Lisa said to me, thank you for finding me again. Because of you, I got to meet this child. I was the one who wanted to say thank you. I will protect Lisa and our child. I am determined to cherish this happiness so that our family will never be separated again. My first love was a childhood friend, Lily. We always ran around the backyard together. One day, she took a spectacular fall. Witnessing such a sight, I couldn't help but gasp. Did you see my... She asked, her face turned bright red. My name is Abel Barnett. I have a soft spot for the name my parents gave me. But the parents who gave me this name are no longer in this world. My mother remarried when I was a child. I don't remember anything about my real father. The only father I knew was the man my mother remarried. He was such a kind person, I always thought he was my real father. When I was in grade school, he fell ill due to a sudden cold snap and passed away unexpectedly. My mother, who loved him dearly, was so saddened by his loss that I think it took a toll on her mentally. Her health declined soon after his death, and she passed away too. I was left alone. I learned as a grade schooler that people could indeed die from sorrow. The person who took me in after I was left alone was my paternal grandmother, Bella Barnett. I was told that she was the one who had opposed my parents' marriage till the very end. My grandfather had already passed away, leaving only me and my grandmother as the remaining relatives. But I'm not related to my grandmother by blood. We may not be blood relatives, but the fact remains that we are the only remaining members of the Barnett family. My grandmother took over my grandfather's business and is still actively working. She embodies the word matriarch. She looks frail and might even seem weak. But once she gets going, her intensity is so great that even full-grown men bow down in front of her at the doorway, which I thought was quite terrifying as a child. When I found out I was going to be taken in by such a grandmother, I felt nothing but fear. I remember crying every day until the day I had to move in with such a scary person. I am now 25 years old. My grandmother, who I had always been fearful of, ended up raising me admirably. When we first started living together, neither of us knew how to interact with each other, creating an odd atmosphere, I suppose. The one who acted as a go-between for us was the daughter of the gardener who worked at my grandmother's house, called Lily. When I was first taken in by my grandmother, Lily was just an infant and was left on our porch while her father worked in the garden. Apparently, her father was in the midst of single parenting after his wife had run out on him, and my grandmother had given him permission to bring Lily to work. For three years, my relationship with my grandmother remained at a stalemate, and I never felt at ease when I came home. One day, when I came home from school, there was a mattress laid out on the porch, and the little baby was laying on top of it. When I peeked over, she gave me a big smile. Her face was so adorable that I poked her cheek lightly. 
Suddenly she started crying loudly, and I was taken aback. That's when my grandmother showed up. Welcome home, Abel. Oh dear, it seems she's in a bit of a mood. Picking up the crying infant, my grandmother began to gently soothe her. Seeing this side of my grandmother was something new for me, and I'm pretty sure my face showed my surprise. Swinging gently in my grandmother's arms, the baby seemed to be enjoying herself. She began to laugh gleefully. Grandma, can you do magic? When I asked that, my grandmother gave a slightly surprised look. Then, with a grin, she said, yes, I can. Can grandma's magic make my chest feel better too? Looking at the laughing baby, I said that. My chest always felt cold and hurt. It had been that way since I lost my parents. If my grandmother could do magic, I wanted her magic to make me laugh like this baby. I was a bit more immature than my friends at the time. In response to my words, my grandmother said, it's a secret, and gently placed her hand on my chest. When she came close, a strange scent mixed with the baby's milk smell and the incense my grandmother always burned. As my grandmother gently touched me, my chest became warm. After that, the choking feeling that had always been there in my chest disappeared like you wouldn't believe. That's amazing. It's amazing. It doesn't hurt anymore. I excitedly told my grandmother. I still remember how my grandmother laughed with a somewhat troubled look on her face. From that day on, the strange distance that had been between me and my grandmother vanished. Lily and I are five years apart. When I started middle school, Lily was in elementary school. Lily, who was free to come and go in my grandmother's garden, and I quickly became close friends. Our circumstances were similar, both missing our mothers, and we were closer than my friends at school. Having known Lily since she was a baby, I had always watched her grow up. As she entered the upper grades of elementary school, the attitudes of the boys around her began to change. Lily had grown into a girl who was somehow mature and glamorous. Her father, a head gardener, used to worry about her so much. There was even a time when she was approached by a suspicious person on her way home from school and rushed into our garden with a terrified expression on her face. Lily couldn't stand herself for being that way. I remember that was around the time she cut her hair short and stopped wearing skirts. After graduating from college, I spent a year unemployed, staying with my grandmother. She was getting old and her health was beginning to fail. Her health had started to decline when I was in my sophomore year of high school. It was around the time I was deciding which college to attend. My grandmother told me to do whatever I wanted so I decided to attend the closest low-ranked university from my home in my hometown. My class advisor tried to persuade me to aim for a more prestigious college, but I had no intention of leaving my grandmother. Of course, I got into the university. After graduation, I spent a year caring for my grandmother. Once her health finally stabilized, I started job hunting and managed to secure employment. Since I had no intention of leaving my hometown, I decided to work at a major advertising agency located here. I figured the one-year gap wouldn't matter much. I thought so, but the world isn't that sweet. I was made painfully aware of this on the day of the job offer ceremony. There were five other new recruits apart from me, all of whom were elites who had graduated from prestigious universities and seemed to take pride in that. The person in charge of training us new recruits was Mr. Baker, who also graduated from a prestigious university. I was surprised to see him blatantly favor the junior employees who had graduated from the same university as him. Being a low-ranked university graduate, I was treated like I wasn't even human. It's been like this since the pre-joining orientation, and I'm sick and tired of it every day. Oh, you look so fed up again today. 
My grandmother, who had regained some of her energy, was sitting on a rocking chair in a room with a view of the garden, knitting something. Even though she was frail and getting older, the strength in her eyes hadn't been changed. Um, I've realized that the world can be quite tough. I tell my grandmother about Mr. Baker in a humorous way. My grandmother laughed heartily at my story. Wow, there is such an old-fashioned man like him still around. Huh. Anyway, Lily's back after a long time. What? Lily. Hearing Lily's name blew away my gloomy mood in an instant. I haven't seen Lily, who should be 20 years old this year, since she graduated from junior high school. We've only been keeping in touch through emails. Apparently, Lily had consulted with my grandmother about her future path when she was about to graduate from junior high school. Lily was firm that she didn't need to attend high school to fulfill her dream. Of course, her father, Gardner Depp, was strongly opposed. He insisted that she should go to high school, leading to arguments almost every night. One day, when I came home from school, I found my grandmother and the Depps sitting facing each other in the living room. When my grandmother noticed me, she beckoned me over. I took a seat next to my grandmother. Mr. Depp looked troubled, and Lily was deadly serious. I quickly realized this was about her future plans. I understand what you're coming from, Dad. I get the importance of high school, but I don't need it. Lily was the first to speak up. Even so, you must understand the difficulties you'll face in the real world without at least a high school diploma. Mr. Depp said, seemingly troubled. He seemed past the point of anger. I want to work with horses. I want to become a stable hand. For that, I need to train at a ranch. I don't want to take detours from my dreams. It's easier to become a civil servant in local horse racing than in the major leagues. Still, practical experience is necessary. Starting earlier than others might give her an edge. Lily was earnestly trying to convince her father that it's a waste to enjoy high school life while setting aside what she really wants to do. I've always admired this side of Lily. She's so straightforward, without a shred of hesitation. She has helped me many times when I've felt troubled. Mr. Depp, Lily has a point. There's a lot to gain from high school life, but what if what she gains is not what she needs? Isn't it up to Lily to decide that? Mr. Depp seemed to choke on his words at my comment. I think he was lost for words. I agree with you. I think Mr. Depp is just worried about Lily. So, can you leave Lily's future to me? I'll find a proper training place. I promise. Let's witness the path of the youth together. My grandmother gently spoke to Mr. Depp. I've always thought there's a persuasive power in my grandmother's voice. It's hard to argue against it. In the end, Mr. Depp gave in, and Lily left for a ranch in Alaska right after graduating middle school. We haven't seen each other for quite a while since then. Now, Lily is back from Alaska. I felt a bit upset that she didn't contact me. She said she didn't want to bother you because you're busy with your new job. I'd rather see her healthy and happy than avoid meeting out of consideration. I genuinely felt that. The next day, there was an orientation before starting my new job. I was heading to the company with a feeling of disgust from early morning. Mr. Depp was already starting to prune the plants in the garden. The scent of the plants calmed me down a little. The snipping sounds echoed pleasantly in the still cool air. I had some time left, so I quietly watched Mr. Depp working for a while. He's aged a little and gained the dignity of a master. Apparently, he's planning to take on a few apprentices next year. I think that being a craftsman himself, Mr. Depp must have understood Lily's feelings better than anyone. As I got older, I finally began to notice things like this. Master Abel, is today your company's entrance ceremony. Mr. Depp, 
noticing my gaze, stopped his work. Even though I'm 25, he still calls me Master Abel. It feels a bit awkward, but it's also somewhat comforting. Actually, today is just an orientation. It's a training before joining the company. There's a lot to learn, I said, scratching my head, and Mr. Depp let out a hearty laugh. Well, it's just the beginning, isn't it? Keep it up. Bolstered by Mr. Depp's encouragement, I managed to get going. After bidding him goodbye with I'm off, I headed for the office. Once I arrived at work, it was clear I was the outsider. The fact that a guy like me, who graduated from a low-ranked college and had spent time unemployed, was hired became a hot topic. Mr. Baker was loudly discussing my background with the other newcomers. It's like he doesn't know the concept of personal privacy. And even though he knew I had walked into the room, he didn't stop the conversation. He ended it by saying, he must have some big connections, looking at me right in the eyes. I try not to let it get to me, but it's irritating to be called Mr. Bottom T University all day. What were you doing after graduation, Mr. Bottom T University, unemployed, right? Were you a neat? I'm fed up with Mr. Baker who keeps picking on me at every opportunity. Having to listen to his stories about how much effort he put into getting into this company and about his university exploits makes it hard to absorb the important training content. But the obvious bullying didn't stop there. I was the only one not given any documents or not notified of room change from the conference room. It was like the kind of teasing you'd see in elementary school. It was so ridiculous, I seriously considered leaving halfway through. If this is what working here is like, this could go on forever. That thought alone rains all my energy. All I can do is pray I get assigned to a department as far from Mr. Baker as possible. But the problem isn't just Mr. Baker. The whole company's atmosphere is like Mr. Baker's. While he may be an extreme case, it's common practice here to judge people by their education, as if that defines who they are. I got a strong sense of this prevailing trend. After a dreary day of training, I returned home to find Lily cleaning the yard. I found myself not being able to say hi to her for a moment. Oh, Abel, it's been a while. Lily greeted me swinging with a bamboo broom. Her waist seemed unusually thick. I kind of messed up, I'm back home for treatment. Noticing my gaze, she lifted her shirt's hem with a swift motion. Underneath was a white cast. Apparently, she fell off a horse during training. She's come home to recover while she's on leave. Working at the stable involves a lot of heavy lifting. The ranch owner told her that her back is crucial and she should get it treated properly. Watching Lily with the bamboo broom in her hands, I'm reminded of our childhood days playing together in the garden. My first love was Lily. One day, I recalled Lily taking a dramatic tumble in the yard. After she fell, Lily asked shyly, looking up, Did you see me? I answered instinctively, uh, Yes. From the next day on, she wouldn't speak to me for a week. I remember that was hard. Are you reminded of something silly now? She noticed right away when I got lost in old memories. She raises the bamboo broom, intimidating me. No, no, not at all. Lily, broom in hand, starts chasing me as I panic. I run away without thinking. My grandmother was laughing loudly from the porch, watching us run all around the yard. Don't you feel pain from running so much? Out of breath due to lack of exercise, Lily still chases me with a calm look. Of course it hurts. I'm savoring the pain. It seems she is experiencing pain as a lesson from the mistake she made. I thought it was a stern, Lily-like statement. It's the path I chose. This pain is nothing. Eventually, I was easily caught and Lily climbed onto my back in victory. 
She didn't care that my suit was getting dirty. Lily raised a victory shout on my back. I completed the pre-employment training, and it was the day of the entrance ceremony. I was still unsure. Whether it's the right decision to join that company, I was still doubting. Yet, I put on my suit, tightened my tie, and headed towards the company from the front door, regardless of my own will. If I keep piling up days like this, my current situation might become a laughing matter someday. I feel like I was deceiving myself by thinking that way. Bad premonitions are often right, and an incident occurred at the entrance ceremony. It happened just before the ceremony started. As usual, Mr. Baker started messing with me. In front of the guests from outside the company, he loudly called me Bottom T University guy. It's surprising you made it to the entrance ceremony. People from F-ranked universities really have thick skins. Mr. Baker intentionally speaks so loudly that the guests can hear that I'm from a bottom T university. I tried to brush him off with a forced smile. How did you manage to get employed? Wouldn't it be better to say it openly in front of everyone? Mr. Baker seemed to enjoy ridiculing me. It's honestly annoying how persistent he is in picking on me. The guests started to stir a bit. Probably a reaction to the word nepotism. I'd really like to see the face of your parents who got you in here using connections, sneered Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker said it triumphantly to me, who said nothing in return. You want to see his parent? I raised him. A stern voice echoed throughout the hall. I quickly turned towards the voice and saw my grandmother sitting in a wheelchair. Dressed in a suit, with a guest ribbon pinned to her chest. The wheelchair was pushed closer to Mr. Baker and myself. It was Lily, who was pushing the wheelchair. Mr. Baker was taken aback at the sudden appearance of my grandmother. The moment my grandmother moved forward, the executives began to rustle. I raised him. Do you have a problem with that? My grandmother's eyes were filled with anger. Mr. Baker was at a loss for words at her power. Just a moment ago he was openly belittling me. Now he was like a frog being stared down by a snake. Now, what to do? After my grandmother said it, casting a glance towards the executive seats. The executives were flistered by her appearance. Her company is a client of this company. Most of the deals are made with the company my grandmother runs. It seems that my grandmother was called to give a congratulatory speech to the new employees. Of course, the executives knew about me. They had even told me during the interview that I wasn't hired due to nepotism. Mr. Baker seemed to have realized his mistake as he noticed the executives are getting agitated. Isn't the level of civility in this company too low? No one stopped the belittling attitude. I think this disqualifies it as a business partner and as Abel's workplace. What do you think about that, Chairman? Lily said. My grandmother nodded slowly at Lily's words. Then she turned to me and said, let's go home, Abel. I felt oddly refreshed. Right, I didn't want to join this company. I've caused a fuss. Please continue the ceremony. I'll take my grandson with me. We'll contact you about the contracts, said my grandmother. The executives raised their voices. Wait, please. Mr. Baker was being yelled at to apologize. But it seemed like my grandmother didn't hear any of the commotion. With a cool face, my grandmother said, let's go home. Back home, I faced my grandmother again. She told me that she had been worried about me going to work every day with a gloomy face. Abel, don't you have something you really want to do? Honestly, I was surprised when you chose that company. My grandmother stumbled over her words. She probably sees through everything. I chose that company for my grandmother. You're too kind. Live more freely. She spoke in a tone that revealed she understood I had chosen my employment in a place that would please my grandmother. 
I resolve myself. Taking a deep breath, I bowed deeply until my forehead touched the floor. Please, let me become Mr. Depp's apprentice as a landscaper. I had always admired Mr. Depp for his craftsmanlike demeanor. Having lost my father at an early age, Mr. Depp was the man I admired, the adult figure I looked up to. I want to live as a craftsman, I said. Speaking out the words that were stuck in my chest felt like breathing life back into my real self. I'm sorry for holding it in all this time. Inside, I apologized to myself. Afterwards, I officially became Mr. Depp's apprentice. Despite becoming an apprentice, being called Master Abel was somewhat embarrassing. But the instruction in landscaping was strict and relentless. Being told to learn the craft, I was desperate every day just to keep up. But every day was incredibly fulfilling. After her recovery, Lily returned to her ranch in Alaska. She told me that starting next year, she would be working as a stable hand at a local racetrack. I couldn't afford to lose to Lily, who was steadily achieving her dreams. Abel, you're just a late bloomer. She teased me from time to time with such words. Who would become independent first? It felt like a competition. We were physically apart, but I felt closer to Lily than before. After a few years, I had grown enough to be called Mr. Depp's right-hand man. I had decided long ago that once I became independent, I would propose to Lily. And today, I told her that. Honestly, I thought she would say yes right away. But her answer was wait. Lily had started working as a public servant. I painfully understood the meaning behind her wait. I immediately replied, I'll wait as long as it takes. I don't want a foolish relationship where one of us has to endure something. If we respect each other and care for each other, we can wait for each other forever. There's no doubt about that, 